So let's continue on with that cliffhanger of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 and talk about Part 2, the rest of the movie, the rest of the four and a half hour Harry Potter movie that I'm so glad they made into two parts. So they actually made this a really great movie. Um, even though I love the other ones, even though 4, 5, and 6 are kind of disjointed because they have a lot of omissions, they're still great in movies and work well as movies. But I love how this one, the final film, the final film in the Harry Potter films, before we get the Fantastic Beasts movies, but still, it's the final Harry Potter film where everything is... Everything is resolved. Everything is done by the end of the movie. And I already talked about part one, and I love part one as well, even though it's the first half of the movie. Um, and I love part two just as much. And part two... I, I, I consider part one and two equally because they are one movie. They're connected. They're literally the same movie. They're just split into two parts because they couldn't put out a four-and-a-half-hour movie um, into theaters. So, so I really love that... I, I love this one the most, The Deathly Hallows, out of all of them, both of them. I think that it's an incredible film. Um, and starting out with, continuing on with part two, um, it starts out with Snape watching over the school, and he's got some look on his face like there's something that is going to happen differently in this movie with Snape. Snape is going to be resolved in a different way that you expect. Because Snape has always had his alliances unclear what he really wants, what his end game is, and this one tells that story later in the movie, but um, but basically the beginning of the movie is just Harry, after Dobby died, he gets Grip Hook to take him and Hermione and Ron to Gringotts to get the, to check what's in uh, Bellatrix's vault, which will have a Horcrux in it, so they go there and find Ravenclaw's cup and take it with them. Um, but after Grip Hook betrays them, because they were going to portray Grip Hook, they get out of there after they fight this giant dragon and fly out in London with the giant dragon, which is cool. And I like how whenever they, whenever they start after that, like, Harry immediately realizes that, Voldemort realizes that he's actually figured out Voldemort's dastardly plan, that, like, he's made seven Horcruxes and that he's killing them all off so Voldemort will be mortal once again so I love that Voldemort knows so it's a fight between both of them trying to figure out how both of them will evade the other one um, and I really like the fact that after like I said after they fight, they ride the dragon they get off of it and then Voldemort has that rage and realizes um, realizes that Harry's doing this and and he, uh, in his vision, sees Hogwarts in, like, whenever Harry's seeing Voldemort's mind. So Harry immediately knows some, there's a Horcrux at Hogwarts, at least one. So they have to go there. Um, and they meet Aberforth Dumbledore, which, um, it, like, he was in five, technically, but he was just in, like, one shot in that movie. Even though in the book he's more established, like... Like you, he's more established in book five, but you see one shot of him in the movie of five. But Aberforth Dumbledore is introduced here, even though he's shown already. But Aberforth Dumbledore, Dumbledore's brother. The thing I love about this character is that you get the idea that he, the way that he talks about his brother, about Dumbledore, how he sacrificed everything for power, how he even sacrificed their sister, um, who couldn't control magic, like in bursts. She would, they would happen in bursts. You couldn't control them. She died over this fight between uh, Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore, and Gellert Grindelwald, and they had this fight in the books, and it's not described in the movie, but they have that fight, and that kills Ariana in the process. So, Aberforth in this movie says, like, that his brother sacrificed everything for power, including Ariana. Which was a good way of showing how Dumbledore is human, like he has flaws, he has true flaws like that, like having a sister dead, um, and I really like that, I love that they kept that in here, um, even though in the end it doesn't feel like it's truly resolved, it just feels like like he uh, he did wrong things, but I guess that makes sense because he's just human, it, it kind of connects to that, he's just a human being that does wrong, like, yeah, like most people do, or everybody does to be fair. Um, and I like how after this they go to the room of requirement into the school 
where everything is blocked off except for the one area through Ariana's portrait. And Harry meets everybody. There's a great reunion. And then they go out and fight Snape and realize that Voldemort is there as well. And this sets up the movie. This sets up part two. This sets up the fight between good and evil. The biggest fight, honestly, like, as big as something like Lord of the Rings in this movie. Like, it's incredible how much the action in this movie is incredible. Um, it blows me away how they did, what they did to the school, everything they did. All these fights between wizards, um, Death Eaters, spiders, statues, giants, um, everything. Like, I love the fact that... It's all these things together fighting off. Like, everybody is fighting for the end. Like, this is the literal end. They are going to... Either one side is going to kill each other or the other side is going to kill each other. So I love that. Um, and I love whenever... Like, before the fight happens, actually, whenever Snape... It, Harry comes and talks to Snape. Um, he's hiding in the crowd. And, like, he says, like, How dare you stand where he stood? How... Uh, and like says that like tell them how you killed him that night. Tell him tell them how he asked for you not to, and then he killed you or you killed him. And I love that that sets up the fight between him and McGonagall, between Snape and McGonagall, and it's really a good fight. It's pretty quick, brief, but it's good. Um, and I love how this makes Snape leave, and then Voldemort has his like announcement in everybody's mind where he says like bring me Harry Potter, and everybody will be spared. You have one hour. And then Pansy Parkinson, one of the Slytherin girls, is like, what are you waiting for? Somebody grab him. And then everybody stands up for Harry. And then McGonagall sends all the Slytherin people to the dungeons, which was great. Um, and then they, we have this great scene where they're setting up for battle where McGonagall uses the spell to bring, bring all the statues to life. All the statues will guard and defend everybody. Um, be a great asset. And I love just the great acting moment with whenever that happens and McGonagall sees them walking off the statues and she's next to Molly Weasley and she says to Molly, I've always wanted to use that spell. And it's just so, it's such a sweet moment with her, um, with Maggie Grace, like it, or uh, Maggie Smith, not Maggie Grace, Maggie Smith, whoops, uh, totally different person, but uh but Maggie Smith, like, that's just such an such a sweet scene between with her, like, how she reacts. Like, I love that moment. Um, and I love how then this is where the, Harry's trying to find the next Horcrux, where Luna tells him about Rowena Le uh, Helena Ravenclaw and how she had a diadem, and it's the item that they think will be the thing that's the Horcrux, and it is. And... I like how she tells him it's in the room of requirements, so then there's this great action scene where Harry, Ron, and Hermione go into there, go into the room of requirement. Um, they go and get the diadem. Um, and I like how, well, it actually, may, to be fair, before this, they have Ron and Hermione go to the Chamber of Secrets and get the Basilisk Fangs. So they get the Fangs, destroy the, the Hufflepuff's Cup, and then come back and go to the room requirement with Harry. And they find Rowena Raven calls Diadem. But then not only does Draco Malfoy and Blaze and Goyle appear. They all have a standoff and a fight where Goyle uh, starts kind of an inferno spell. Like where literally the room requirement is being burned to shreds. Burned down everywhere. And I love this action scene. It's one of the coolest action scenes in the movie. Where Harry, Ron, and Hermione get on broomsticks. Goyle falls down and dies uh, while Crab and Blaze are climbing up this literal stack of, like, chairs. And they get up there, they're going to fall down, and, and then Harry has this last moment of saving Malfoy and Blaze. Like, he and Ron grab each one of them, take them with them, and throw them out with them with the room requirement. I love how Harry is such a selfless person, no matter what Malfoy did to him throughout the series. Like, he he saved him at the moment of death, at the very brink of death. And it's great because then they stab the diadem with a basilisk fang, throw it into the, uh, throw it into the room of requirement. And then like, it becomes three Voldemort heads out of flame, just coming at the door, but then the door shuts. That's a great moment. That's really cool. One of the coolest action scenes in the movie, even though the action in this is spectacular, the best action I think is in this movie out of all of them. They really made it perfect. Like in terms of the action as well. Um, 
And, like, whenever Neville is killing the Snatchers on the bridge, like, whenever he breaks the bridge down and all the Snatchers fall down and die, that's a really great moment. Um, and then I like how whenever uh, whenever this happens, whenever the diadem is destroyed, Dump Voldemort immediately realizes even more, like, this is... Like, I don't have any left except for Nagini and maybe another Horcrux that we can't figure out what it is. But Voldemort says, come on, Nagini, we've got to keep you safe. So he takes Nagini with him because he knows he, Harry's there to kill him, to kill her, the snake. Um, and then we have just more battle scenes, which are great. And then we've got this fantastic scene between Snape and Voldemort where Snape is keeping his allegiance to Voldemort, but then... Voldemort realizes that the Elder Wand can't be used by me in, until Snape is dead, so he slits Snape's throat and then has Nagini um, start biting and clawing at his throat. Like, he literally kills him, where after he disappears, Harry, Ron, and Hermione come in, and Snape cries tears, which become the memories for the pensive, or pensive, or however you say it. Um, but then we get my favorite, probably my favorite scene in the whole movie after after this scene where we see the dead bodies um, with with Fred and Tonks and Lupin. That is makes me choke up and makes me really feel sad and actually really is effective. Um, where they, where that moment where you find all their dead bodies is incredibly sad. And then we get to the best moment of the movie, I think, where it just keeps getting better. Where Harry goes into Snape's memories. And this is one of the most saddest things I've ever seen. I legit tear up every time I watch this scene. I could, I can't help myself. It's just that good. But, but man, they have these moments where, it, going into Snape's memories, it starts out with Lily, like, moving a flower magically, and then Petunia is like, freak, I'm going to tell Mama you're a freak. And then Sirius comes out, and then she runs away. Um... But I love that m moment of, like, Lily and James has had, have, had a friendship. I keep talking over myself. They had a friendship um, that was a really good one. Like, a really, really solid friendship that Snape became in love with her. And then they go to school and realize that James Potter falls in love with Lily, too. And then James bullies Snape to the point where Snape doesn't, like, Snape resents James completely. Um, and then we get a great, like, there's so many different memory scenes at once, but I love the moment where Dumbledore tells him to change size for Lily's safety because Snape is losing it. Like, like he knows that Voldemort's going after them because of the prophecy. Um, and then I love how it shows Harry's mom talking to Harry before she dies. Like, she's saying, like, like, Mama loves you, Dada loves you, like, be safe, be strong. And then Voldemort comes in and just kills her. And I love how then it plays to where after they die, there's another scene with Vol with uh, Snape and Dumbledore where Snape says, you said you would keep her safe and after Lily's dead. And then Dumbledore says, Lily and James kept uh, had a bad alliance with somebody where they told the truth, or they told Voldemort, and it was Wormtail, of course, Peter Pettigrew. But... I love that moment. It's just such a sad moment. And, like, Dumbledore tells Snape, like, you need to protect the boy. The boy needs protection. And Snape's like, why does it even matter? The Dark Lord is gone. And then Dumbledore says, the Dark Lord, the Dark Lord will return. And this boy will be in imminent danger. You need to say, you need to help him for her. And it just, again, because of his strong love to Lily, it's just so heartbreaking. Um, and... Then we realize the biggest twist of, like, the books and the movies in which Harry is a literal horcrux and he has to die. Like, he has to be killed by Voldemort when he's at his most weakest. He's got to kill Voldemort. I mean, he's got to kill Harry and he must die. And then we get the scene of Snape looking in at Lily's body and crying and holding her body and crying while Harry's behind her. Baby Harry's behind her crying. That moment is just so incredibly powerful that I just, I can't help myself. It's that good. It's that good of a scene. Um, and you realize that after you realize Harry 
has to die. That Snape sent the Patronus earlier in the movie in Deathly Hallows Part 1 where Harry went down in the water to get the Sword of Gryffindor. Like, that was Snape who did that. That was the Patronus because of Lily, because of his love to her, because of uh, what she... Uh, what her Patronus was, was his. And it's really just a great thing. And it's really incredibly sad. Um, but I love the, these memory scenes. Like, they are incredibly sad and heartbreaking and tearful. Um, and I just love how, after this, Harry realizes that he must die. And he saw everything that Snape was hiding. Every secret, every horrible thing that has happened to him his love for his mother, and his resentment for his father, that it, it's just so good. And then we get this great tearful goodbye from Ron and Hermione whenever they know that Harry has to die. Like, he tells him that, like, and she just goes, I'll go with you, and then he's like, no, you've got to stay here, you've got to kill the snake. That's, and then all that'll be left is him. So they have a really legit tearful goodbye where you think, this is the end, Harry has to die, he has to be gone. They have to go on with this. Um, and then Harry fr uh, realizes with the snitch that he got earlier in part one, whenever he touched his lips on it, it said, I open it to close. He has to say, like, I'm ready to die on it. And then it opens up and it's the resurrection stone, the final deathly hallow, the final one that, that you need to cheat death. So Harry uses the um, resurrection stone and brings back Lily, James, Lupin, and Sirius, and this, like, also with the Snape scene, this is the best scene in the movie, where Harry is seeing his dead family, um, every one of them, and, and I love how his mother just says, you've been so brave, sweetheart, and then, then they have a conversation, all of them, like, I never meant for any of you to die, and, 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 uh, Ramish, your son, and then Lupin just says, well, uh, like, everybody will know what his story is, and that his mother and father died for something, and he'll be, like, he'll, he'll do great. Um, and then we get that great moment where he looks at Sirius and says, what's it like dying? And then Sirius just says, quicker than falling asleep. And then he says to everybody, like, he's scared, and he's not ready, and like, he, and like, he says, will you be here with me? And then this plays to Prisoner of Azkaban. When Snape in Prisoner of Azkaban says, I'm right in here, in his heart, he says that again in this where he just says, we'll always be with you. We're here, you see. And he points at his heart. And that just moment just gets me again because it's so emotionally good. It's so sad because, like, it perfectly encapsulates all these characters' relationships in that moment where, like, they are gone, but they are still there with them, and it's just, it got me. It was so good. Um, I love that. And then Harry goes and dies. He gets killed. The Avada Kedavra curse kills him by Voldemort. And then he's at a King's Cross Station type of area where, like, he finds Dumbledore, and Dumbledore, um who's already dead too, tells him about how you could go back or you could board a train. And by board a train, he means you could literally go die. You can go back to living or you can die. You just killed the part of Voldemort that was inside of you. The reason why you could sneak to speak to snakes, uh, the reason why Voldemort could connect with your mind. So I really thought that was, it's a really fantastic scene. The last scene with Dumbledore is great. Even though he's already dead, it's just so cool seeing him again. Um... So I love that. And then as this happens, Harry comes, decides to come back to life. And Voldemort at the same time blacked out as well. So I love that. I love that he did that. And then Narcissa Malfoy, Voldemort tells her to go check Harry out to see if he's dead. And then she whispers to Harry, like, is he, is he alive, Draco? Is he alive? And then Harry just, as stiffly as he could, because he's supposed to be dead, he moves his head a tiny bit. And then she tells them that he's dead. But I love the fact that she has a she saves him in a sacrifice. Uh, not a sacrifice. She saves him in a way like how it's another mother saving Harry. Like it's Draco's mother this time, and like he did it because he saved Draco earlier. Um, I just think that's a cool connection. Um, so yeah, Harry's dead, and they think everybody thinks he's dead. And that shot of Hagrid walking up to the school, holding Harry with that dead, 
dead eye reaction of him just like he does like he his, Harry's dead like he he knows Harry's dead even though he's not but he thinks he's dead he just has that reaction where he just sits there blank face like he just cannot live anymore he doesn't know what to think um and then Voldemort comes comes up and says Harry Potter is dead to everybody and Neville I love how Neville this character who has got a great like story arc from the first book and movie to this book and movie where Neville was this scared uh, frumpy kind of kid and then he became something much greater something incredible somebody who is a badass somebody who actually stands up to everybody he stands up for he stands up to the biggest bad of them all Voldemort he stands up for what he believes in he tells Voldemort that Harry even though Harry's gone uh, we could still fight on um, it doesn't matter that Harry's gone I mean, we lost Harry tonight, but he's still with us in here. And and he tells about everybody else who died, and he said they didn't die in vain. Um, and and he said, like, it's not over. And he pulls out the sword of Gryffindor, which is was brought back in the sorting hat after Griffhook was killed. And we've got that great moment where Harry just pops out of Hagrid's arms, runs away, and Voldemort is pissed, pissed more than ever, just freaking out. Um... I love that. And then as this happens, all the Death Eaters start leaving and escaping. Voldemort, it's only Voldemort now, besides a couple other Death Eaters, because there's still a fight going on in the school. But most of the Death Eaters flee and are gone and are done with him. And then you see this great shot of the Malfoys just walking away. They're done. And that's a great ending for them. That's a great way for them to finally be resolved and become good. Like, they are not part of this anymore. They are done. Um, they just r literally walk away. Like, it's great. Um, and I love how then this we have the fight where Vol where there's a lot of things happening at once in a great way. Where Voldemort is fighting Harry, chasing him around everywhere while Harry's trying to kill Nagini, the snake. And Ron and Hermione and Neville are trying to kill the snake. And then there's just all this thing, all this stuff happening where Voldemort and Harry would be fighting up in the up in the school, flying, apparating around. Where in the moment they're apparating, they both have their faces meld together to where they're screaming like this, like it's really cool. And and Neville finally kills Nagini whenever they both land down in in the main area of the school. And they have that moment where they both Harry and Voldemort connect wands again. They fight. But then, like, since Harry is the true owner of the Elder Wand now, because he disarmed Draco and Malfoy Manor, part one, he kills Voldemort. And Voldemort literally rots from the inside and just turns to dust. And, like, it's one of the most satisfying villain endings ever. And in the book, he just, like, his body falls down dead, like, it's just an actual human body. But in this one, he, like, becomes dust. Like, he literally fades away, so he's gone. And I I just thought that was such a fantastic way of ending this villain, this horrible villain, and finally getting it over with. Um, and I really like how then it's like, like everybody's just relaxing. There's just a couple scenes of everybody relaxing after Voldemort is killed. Like, they are done. Everything is over. Um... And Harry and Ron and Hermione go outside and just sit there on the broken down remains of the castle and just Harry just explains that what I said earlier in that Draco like Harry disarmed Draco, so the Elder One called to Harry, so that's how Harry defeated Voldemort. But I just love that final moment of all three of them just standing there what like in this broken down remains of the castle. Just standing there and then it cuts to nineteen years later where we get I love how this plays with the first movie where they have the score from John Williams at the end of the first two movies and it ha it plays at the end of this one so it feels truly like this series goes full circle where it's at King's Cross Station and 19 years later Harry and Ginny are married, they have three kids uh, Ron and Hermione are married, they have two kids and they meet. E they all reunite or meet each other at the King's Cross and Albus, Ser Albus Cerberus Potter, like one of his kids, backs up and Harry goes and talks to him. And Albus asks, like, what if I am sorted in Slytherin? And then 
I love this line where Harry says that Albus Cerberus Potter, you were named after two of the greatest wizards ever. Um, one of them was in Slytherin, and he was the bravest man I've ever known. And then the then the Albus just says, "Really?" He says, "Yeah." And then he like explains that you don't. It doesn't matter if you're in Slytherin; it's okay. Um, and then they just hug, and then they all the kids get on the train, and it's just an emotional moment where everything has gone full circle. They've got family now, they've got kids, everything is resolved, Voldemort's been dead for 19 years, and the incredible John Williams score that gives me goosebumps, and gives a lot of people goosebumps, I'm assuming, where they just watch on uh, adult Harry, Ron, and Hermione, and Ginny just watch on as their kids go away to Hogwarts, and it just blows me away in how chilling, and how I get goosebumps, and how I feel so much for these characters in this franchise, because this... This last movie, like, is one of my favorite movies ever. Like, I truly love the Deathly Hallows together, both parts. Like, I love this movie. I think it's an incredible movie. One of my favorite movies ever. Like, if I had to say, like, I've got a... If I had, like, a top five or top ten, like, favorite movies ever, these two would be in that as one, the Deathly Hallows movies. Like, they are that good for me in terms of... In terms of emotion, in terms of action, in terms of satisfaction in a movie like everything about this movie satisfies me in a way where it's so incredibly emotional and so it feels so incredibly warranted how they did a fantastic job with this last movie and with all of the movies honestly they're all great but but this one's my favorite deadly hallows one and two so wow this this was a this was just I'm, I'm losing words because I loved it so much because it was so good. It was such a fantastic movie just re-watching it. One of my absolute favorite movies ever made. So, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I, if you stayed um, till the end, thank you so much. Next up will be the first Fantastic Beasts movie. So we're going back before all the Harry Potter movies to talk about the first prequel um, before The Crimes of Grindelwald comes out this Thursday. So thank you guys so much for watching um, and take care.